Hello, and welcome to So You Want to Be a Law Professor, sponsored by the American Bar Association Union Lawyers Division Women of Color Task Force. My name is Daiquiri Steele, and I'm an assistant professor of law at the University of Alabama School of Law, where I teach and write in the areas of civil rights, labor and employment, education law, legislation and regulation, and torts. I also have the pleasure of serving as special advisor to the ABA YLD Women of Color Task Force. The YLD Women of Color Task Force was born out of the vision of the current ABA YLD Chair, Choi Portis. The task force seeks to examine the experiences of women of color in the legal profession, to identify and effectively address the unique challenges they face, and to provide them with tools to build community. We have a talented group of members from around the nation, and I'd like to take a moment to recognize them. Starting with Heather Horn, co-chair of the task force from Los Angeles, California. Also, Janae Lamar, co-chair of the task force from Saginaw, Michigan. Mary Magdalene Onyango, vice chair of the task force from Washington, DC. And members Nan Ho of Detroit, Michigan, Christina Hornsby of Miami, Florida, Lo Nelson of Madison, Wisconsin, and Jessica Perez of Bernalillo, New Mexico. The task force has planned a series of programs for this bar year aimed at examining the unique challenges women of color face throughout the legal profession. Last month, the task force hosted a program that focused on law firms. Earlier this month, the task force hosted a program geared towards young lawyers interested in the judiciary. In the spring, the task force will host a program addressing lawyers in corporate counsel settings. However, today's program addresses legal academia. The goal is to expose attendees to the types of full-time positions that are available in legal academia with a specific focus on clinical, doctrinal, and legal research and writing positions. The program will also explore the teaching, research, and service components of professorships. The format for today's program will be as follows. First, I will introduce today's speakers. I will begin the program by engaging our speakers in a dialogue about positions in legal academia. And towards the end of the program, we will have a question and answer session. All lines will be muted. So if you have questions, please uh, go ahead and submit your question via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And so with that, I'd now like to go ahead and introduce you to today's speakers, starting with Professor Emily Bazzotti. Professor Bazzotti is an assistant professor of law at California Western School of Law. Her research and teaching interests are in the fields of art and cultural heritage law. She teaches property, copyright, Latinos and the law, and art and cultural heritage law. With a background in art history, Professor Bazzotti's research focuses on the interdisciplinary connection between the law and the arts within a national and international framework. Her current work explores issues of restitution and the prohibition against the destruction of cultural heritage as developing norms of customary international law. As an attorney, Professor Bazzotti practiced in the areas of art and entertainment law, including intellectual property, contracts, immigration, and civil litigation. Professor Bazzotti is chair of the ABA Young Lawyers Division Entertainment and Sports Law Committee. She is also the vice chair of the International Division of the ABA Forum on Entertainment and Sports Industries. She also serves as an associate ed editor of TYL. Professor Bazzotti was recognized as one of the ABA's 40 top, top young lawyers and one of the Orlando Business Journal's 40 Under 40. Next, we have Professor Megan Boone. Professor Boone is an associate professor of law at Wake Forest Law School. She teaches and researches on topics related to the state regulation of the physical body, often focusing on the rights of pregnant, birthing, and parenting individuals. Because of her deep and expansive research focus, Professor Boone is considered an expert on matters related to lactation law, reproductive rights, family law, and gender equality in the workplace, among other timely topics. In 2020, she was named the winner of the American Association of Law Schools Scholarly Papers Competition for her George Washington University Law Review article, Reproductive Due Process. Professor Boone's 
previously served as an assistant professor at the University of Alabama School of Law. And from 2016 to 2018, she was a visiting professor of law at Wake Forest Law, where she taught civil procedure among other subjects. She is also a former clinical teaching fellow for the Institute for Rep Representation at Georgetown University Law Clinic. Our next speaker is Professor Benet Harpalani, Henry Wehoffen, Professor and Associate Professor of Law at the University of New Mexico School of Law. Professor Harpalani teaches courses in constitutional law, civil rights, civil procedure, and employment discrimination. He was the recipient of the 2017 Derek A. Bale Jr. Award from the Association of American Law Schools Section on Minority Groups and the 2016 Junior Teaching Faculty Award from the Society of American Law Teachers. His scholarship focuses on the intersections between race, education, and law, as he explores the nuances of racial diversity and identity from various disciplinary perspectives. His writings have covered topics such as affirmative action in university admissions, racial ambiguity, skin color discrimination, and the psychological development of racial identity. Professor Harpalani's articles have been cited in legal briefs or opinions at the U.S. Supreme Court, U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, and the New York Court of Appeals. Next, we have Professor Shakira Pleasant, Assistant Professor of Law and Director of the Legal Writing Resource Center at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Professor Pleasant teaches lawyering skills and has previously taught advanced appellate advocacy, pre-trial advocacy, client interviewing and counseling, and legal communication and research. She also previously taught at law schools and undergraduate campuses in Miami, Savannah, and Washington, DC. As a licensed attorney, Professor Pleasant worked in Washington, DC and has experience in land use, administrative law, regulation and policy drafting, disability law, and HIPAA slash privacy law. Her scholarly interests include higher education, disability law, and process management and improvement. Her goal as director of the Writing Resource Center is to ensure that students experience or students experience is both enlightening as well as empowering. She believes that growth mindset is essential to the practice of law, and she impresses upon her students that clear, concise, and thoughtful legal drafting is a necessary skill to have a long professional career. Finally, we have Professor Shonda Sibley, Assistant Clinical Professor of Law, Scheller Center for Social Justice at Temple University Beasley School of Law. Professor Sibley directs the Systemic Justice Clinic at the Scheller Center for Social Justice, where she works with students on issues related to the collateral consequences experienced by individuals who have had contact with the criminal legal system. Professor Sibley's scholarship focuses on criminal law and procedure as informed by critical legal and critical race theory. She is particularly interested in seeking out places where making relatively small procedural or administrative interventions can produce substantial substantive benefits to criminal defendants and the criminal legal system. Before joining the faculty of Temple Law, Professor Sibley was an acting assistant professor and the associate director of lawyering at New York University School of Law, where she was awarded the Podell Distinguished Teaching Award in 2019. Prior to entering legal academia, she was an appellate public defender representing indigent criminal defendants on direct appeal and collateral proceedings in New York City. Her earlier experience includes litigation, and transactional practice at two international law firms and a clerkship for the Honorable Eric L. Clay of the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. So as you can tell from their bios, our speakers have diverse backgrounds and took many different paths to joining the Legal Academy. One takeaway that is particularly important for me to uh, make sure that attendees leave with is that there is no one way to become a law professor. And so we're gonna go ahead and jump into our questions so we can hear a little bit more about how that process materialized for our panelists. So starting with our first question, what is the difference between a clinical, doctrinal, and legal research and writing law professor? So 
I'll start with talking about what clinical professors do, um, and then everyone can make the comparison uh, be between that doctrinal LRW. Um, and so an easy way to think about what clinical teaching is, is by analogy to the residency of a medical school, right? And so there is a part in medical school where there's basically just classroom teaching, right? And then there's a second part of medical school where they take that classroom teaching and they use it to actually practice on patients, but they're still learning, right? And so they're learning through practice. And that's what clinical legal education is, is uh, that we basically use experiential pedagogy to impart substantive law and legal practice skills to our students. So what does that look like? It looks like the fact that we take cases. And so we use students to take cases, to do legislative advocacy, to do community education and partnerships, to do all kinds of what we, what we describe as lawyerly interventions. And so in, a, in addition to kind of teaching substantive law, we're also actually out kind of on the streets doing the work of lawyers with our students. And I can jump in to talk a little bit about doctrinal teaching. So I actually started in the clinic as a clinical uh, professor. Um, so maybe I'm well situated to talk about uh, the differences in what life feels like now versus then. Um, I will say just as a caveat, like the things that I'm about to say, there are some there are some things that are true of legal writing and doctrinal and clinical across institutions. And there are some things that are gonna be really different depending on the institution you're at, both in sort of what the, what the job looks like and what the expectations of the job are. There's some sort of your mileage will vary depending on the school you're at. Um, in general, doctrinal professors are expected to teach the um, sort of larger lecture-based classes on substantive areas of the law, in addition to usually some smaller seminar seminars on um, various substances area, areas of the law. Um, they're often, but not always, expected uh, to teach at least one course in the sort of core 1L curriculum, especially just starting out. The expectation is often one of your courses might be in that core 1L curriculum. Um, and there's often, and I know we're going to talk about this uh, a little bit later, and again, varies by institution, there's often sort of different um, expectations or requirements as far as scholarship when you're in a doctrinal position. Um, so I'll put a pin in the scholarship discussion, but when people have the sort of stereotypical idea of the law professor, you know, at the lecture, lectern in front of the big room, generally what they're thinking of is a doctrinal law. And I will say, Megan, thank you for that softball and Shonda the frame, um, because I think legal writing is kind of a marriage of both. Um, especially when you have um, professors who were previously practitioners entering the classroom and teaching legal writing. So legal writing is a course that everyone takes when they come to law school, right? It is a requirement by the ABA. And so in the legal writing classroom, if you're a first year professor as I am, then you literally are helping students learn the basics of how lawyers write, the structures in which we expect to see both in writing and practice and or if you were writing um, you know, bench memos and things like that, if you were, say, a clerk. I think the, the difference really is subject matter and kind of how Shauna described it, which is in the legal writing classroom, our students aren't on the ground. They don't usually have live cases unless their legal writing professor um, has that as part of their design of their course. Um, typically, it's an artificial scenario, but still, you are merging substance um, you need to think about the bigger picture of what it means to be a lawyer as you're drafting. And ultimately, the way legal writing professors work is they will work in conjunction and usually in collaboration with a lot of people at the school, which may include doctrinal professors, may include clinical professors, it may even include the research librarians, because all of those things combined are a part of legal writing. Awesome. So second question. How did you all go about determining what courses you would teach once you actually entered academia? I guess I'll uh, start there. So when you're applying uh, for legal academic jobs, that's typically one of the questions, you know, what courses would you like to teach? Uh, and uh, uh, often that's connected to the research or scholarship that you're doing. So for me, I was writing about uh, affirmative action in university admissions. 14th Amendment issue, equal protection. So constitutional law 
was a natural fit right there. Um, so that was the, kind of the core decision there was, you know, that's the uh, standard law school, uh, core law school course that would fit most with my scholarship. And then I proposed some more specialized courses uh, along with that, like a race in the law, uh, civil rights, uh, courses like that, that are also related uh, to my scholarship. Uh, and I also put down uh, some uh, 1L courses because those there's a need for that. Uh, civil procedure was my favorite uh, 1L course. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't really have a background there. I don't have a practice background. So I'm not a logical civil procedure person, but it was just one that I liked and one, you know, there's some need for. Uh, I had written down torts also. But the advice is, uh, I think, you know, as, as was said before, to have some core classes that, that you can teach. Uh, if you have a background in, say, business, uh, pri any private law, really, you know, corporations, business, or, or areas like tax or bankruptcy, there's a greater need for those courses. There are fewer people uh, out uh, on the job market who can teach those courses. So that's great. I didn't know anything about those subjects. So, you know, I, did, I didn't put those down. Uh, so you want to think about just where your scholarship is, uh, you know, what you're writing about or what your, what your interest is. Also, you know, for those who have practiced, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure many of you have, what areas you've practiced in, you want to just be able to uh, justify your choices, you know, because they'll ask you, you know, what classes you want to teach and why. So you want to have kind of a story to tell there. And I will say serving, uh, recently serving on the appointments committee, that's something that is, is looked at. What whether you have experience with that particular subject, whether that particular subject correlates to your research interest. So it's important that you have a connection to the types of courses that you want to teach. For me, uh, although I didn't teach in real property, I practiced copyright, I practiced in, uh, in art law. So a lot of the personal property aspects flowed well with, with uh, teaching property one and property two. So it, it melded well with my scholarship interest. And luckily I'm at a school where I can create uh, seminars that correlate to my research interest. So that's when you're looking at, when you're on the market and looking for specific schools, you also wanna see how flexible they're going to be with whether you're gonna be permitted to teach certain seminars or whether there's already somebody on the faculty that's teaching courses that, that you wanna teach. So that's something to look at when you're exploring your options. Just uh, piggybacking off of that. So uh, similar to the professors have, have already spoken, when I was uh, starting out, my main inquiry is uh, what can I teach and what does the market want? What will they let me teach? Um, with like maybe just a sprinkling of what do I actually wanna teach? Um, I was a civil litigator, so civil procedure made sense for me. And there, there was a need there at the time that I was sort of looking for a job and on the market. But I will say, as sort of Professor Bazzotti was just mentioning, now that I'm a few years in, I'm at an institution where I can um, sort of move more into the courses that I want to teach because I want to teach them. So uh, when I was on the market, you know, I very much wanted to teach reproductive justice and feminist legal theory. And it's not that schools don't want those things. It's just not that there's a there's a big curricular need, right? No, no school is on the market looking for a professor for those subjects. Um, but that doesn't mean that I don't get to teach them now. Um, so you should maybe have, when you're thinking about what classes you want to teach, think about it like, what classes am I going to use to sort of get the job? And then what classes would I ideally like to teach as I sort of move forward in my career? Um, so this next question is for Professors Boone and Bazzotti. What do you feel are the most important skills necessary to be an effective law teacher, regardless of what subject you are actually teaching? Um, I think you have to meet your students where you are, where they are. Um, and so that requires uh, flexibility. It requires you to be open to feedback. Uh, it requires you to try to remember what it was like to be a a 1L, the, the farther you get away from the time when you were a 1L, the harder that becomes. But um, I think that just that sort of, um, that sort of openness uh, it is really important um, because at the end of the day, right, your job is to make sure that they understand the material. And if they're not understanding the material, you're not doing your job. Um, but I will, would also just say, um, you wanna think about whether you, you're gonna be good at it if you enjoy it. So if you are someone who enjoys standing in front of a group of people, or depending on the class you're teaching, working with a small group of people, 
and answering questions on the spot. And, and that is exciting. Not that you never get nervous, right? I still get nervous sometimes on the first day of class. But if that's something that feels exciting, then you're going to be good at doing it. If that's something that feels terrifying to you, the idea of standing in front of 50, 60, 100 sometimes uh, law students and, and lecturing and answering questions, then it's going to be a struggle for you. Um, so I think you should just sort of be honest about your skill set and what you like and, and how that fits with sort of the different types of professor options that we've talked about. I'll hop on to what Professor Boone said. I, when I was younger in law school, I definitely was not a an extroverted outgoing person did not want to be called on. And then now I'm a law professor that enjoys teaching in front of a classroom. So being able to, to recognize that skill set, I agree, is in, incredibly important. Um, another skill that I think is also important is patience. With students, you have to be able to, to recognize that some of your students might not understand the material in a way that the other students will. So you have to be able to clarify and simplify some concepts. So for example, when I'm teaching rule against perpetuities, I have to simplify it in a way that it's going to be digestible for my students. So you, if you are able to do that, I think students will appreciate you immensely and you'll become a better teacher that way. Awesome. So Professor Pleasant, as our resident expert on uh, um, legal research and writing, this next question is for you. What are the most challenging aspects of teaching legal research and writing specifically, and how have you been able to overcome these challenges? So on the day-to-day, -day, like semester to semester, I think for me, the most challenging is grading. Um, and that I think is also dependent upon the school. So I've taught at schools where you know, I had maybe 10 students and I've taught at schools where I've had 25 to 30 in one section and I taught two sections. So just imagine the breadth of papers that I am grading. And it's not just one paper, one and done. It's sequential consecutive sort of papers. So two, three, four documents in a given semester. And so times that by the number of students. So I think that's been one of the most challenging, but I think the other point I do want to make, and some of my colleagues touched on this earlier, is depending upon the institution, I'd say choosing to be a professor of legal research and writing, be mindful of what your institution thinks about that particular course, the number of units assigned to it, um, and kind of the requirements that come with it. Because I think what I didn't know when I started out teaching as an adjunct is the dynamics within legal academia as it relates to different sort of uh, positions or disciplines that you teach. And I think navigating that and being very clear about why I wanna teach legal writing, why I stay in legal writing, and you know how I choose an institution where I want to thrive and grow is also important and a challenge that I've, I'm still working through. I won't even say I've overcome it yet. I'm still working through that piece. Awesome. And Professor Sibley, same question to you, only in a clinical setting. So what are the most challenging aspects of teaching in a clinical setting and how have you been able to overcome those? So I think that the most challenging aspect is that for clinical professors, there are a lot of moving parts. Um, and so we have to develop student projects, right? And we have to select them and we have to nurture uh, outside relationships, so relationships outside of the law school that will make those student projects possible. Um, and there's not as much guidance for that, right? Uh, uh, podium professors can, can often reach reach back to, fur to, not further, to prior generations of podium professors and say, can you share your syllabus? Can you share your materials? There are case books, there are case book guides, there are all kinds of things, right? But for clinicians, oftentimes you're making the road, <laughs> right? And so it's a very different experience. Um, I think as a practical matter, um, semester timing and academic timing is not human timing. <laughs> and so since we're working with human projects on semester, <laughs> in semester blocks, that often creates difficulties uh, that we have to manage. Um, and I think that in terms of kind of institutional expectations, there's been a drift 
uh, with clinicians where a lot of schools are actually requiring clinicians to do the same amount and types of scholarship as podium professors, while we're also sometimes teaching doctrinal classes and teaching our seminars and running our clinics, right? And so all of a sudden we have kind of four jobs. Um, and so and so it's, it's just kind of uh, a kind of juggling act and lots of moving pieces. And you're really kind of the, you're the king of your own fiefdom, right? Like it's your clinic. And so, and so things kind of rise and fall on you, right? And things are not planned if you don't plan them and they don't happen if you don't make them happen. And so it's, it's, it's just that you have to really kind of uh, keep all of those things in mind all of the time to make sure that everything from the, from the outside looks quite smooth, <laughs> right? Where behind the scenes, sometimes you're kind of frantically trying to make sure that everything kind of falls into place. Absolutely. One of my rules of thumb is if I don't panic, neither will my students. So I have to try to <laughs> remain calm. Exactly. So pivoting to doctrinal teaching, Professor Harpalani, what is the most challenging aspect of doctrinal law teaching and how have you been able to overcome it? Yeah, so uh, I think, you know, doctrinal classes tend to be larger. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the clinical and legal writing, you have more interaction with students. There's a lot more work, you know, giving feedback to students and working directly with students. Uh, so you get to connect with students a bit more. Uh, for doctrinal classes at some law schools, you know, your 1L sections could be over 100. Uh, some of them, they're smaller, they vary. But it's harder to really connect with students and also to gauge where they are. And, you know, that's a challenge uh, as the semester goes along, uh, just you know, gauging where students are, trying to make uh, those adjustments to make sure that uh, all students uh, are, are able to learn. Uh, and as, as I said, uh, you know, it's a bit easier when the classes are smaller, but even as you gauge where students are, and I think this is probably a common problem uh, with clinic and, and legal writing teaching, you have students at different places, you know, um, and when you're in front of the classroom in the doctrinal class, you know, uh, particularly if you're using like the Socratic method, uh, just kind of trying to individually gauge where the students are and then adjust to that because there are more students. It it's, can be challenging to do. And particularly even in a small class, you know, I've had classes, the like evening classes that I taught at the Savannah Law School when I was there, where you might have only, you know, eight or nine students, but they're at very different levels. So you have to kind of uh, manage how the class goes, make sure that you're not leaving the students, uh, uh, some of the students behind, but make sure you're also challenging the ones who, uh, you know, who are getting the material. So I think you know, just kind of managing the whole class dynamic uh, is, is a challenge for uh, doctrinal teaching. I also want to note, though, that, you know, there are, are particular challenges for women and women of color in just uh, establishing authority in the classroom. And I think this is something that probably cuts across the practice of law and really all different professions and, and society altogether. Those aren't challenges that I face, but just, you know, talking to my women and women of color colleagues, just making sure that students treat you with respect, that they respect your authority. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, Many of you are probably familiar with, with those dynamics and, uh, you know, would know, uh, at least over time, you know, uh, just to how to deal with those. But that is a, a, a special challenge, I think, that women and women of color face. Awesome. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about what happened before you got into a law school classroom. So Professors Pleasant and Boone, how has your experience in law practice informed your law teaching? So I'll, I'll start it off. I actually feel like when I first started teaching, it like informed it completely because one, I was new, I didn't really know what I was doing. Luckily I had a director of my legal writing program as an adjunct. And so she gave me a lot of guidance, but also a lot of latitude to bring in practice. And at that time I was working for the office of the attorney general in Washington, DC. And so I could bring in not only anecdotal stories to my students, but really relate what we were working on in the classroom to practice on an everyday level because I was doing it every day. Fast forward to transitioning into full-time teaching, I've now been out of practice officially, what, six years? And so I'm actually finding it more difficult to bring that back into the classroom. And so having conversations with my colleagues in the clinic who are still actively working cases or talking to my friends who are actively practicing um, I try to bring in that information as much as possible. I think going to something Professor Harpawani said, it's the connectivity to the students um, where I find that uh, my experience in law practice kind of helps them think about what they're doing and how 
the impact is beyond the classroom. And I do the same thing when I work with students in the Legal Writing Resource Center because our philosophy is the bigger picture. It's not just what you're doing in school, it's gonna be when you're in clinic, when you're in an internship or externship and how the work is going to inform um, what you do later on. Yeah, I, I would echo all of um, those sentiments from Professor Pleasant. Um, you know, and this is a theme that I think we've already hit on that ideally there is sort of a overlap, a synergy between your law practice experience, your scholarship interests and the classes that you teach. Um, so your, you know, the courses that you might teach might just reflect the, the practice area that you have experience in. That was certainly true for me. I was a civil litigator um, I did sort of complex uh, class action litigation. So again, Civ, Civ Pro was a really obvious fit for me um, because of that. Um, but I also just think that law practice is, is really important to helping our students understand the context that all of these sometimes like dense theoretical things that they're learning actually look like when they're on their feet and what the things they're actually gonna run into um, in practice. And uh, similar to Professor Pleasant, I feel like the longer I'm, I have been out of practice, the more I uh, am getting rusty on those things. So my plan actually post tenure is to like start taking on just a pro bono case here and, here and again, so that I can keep that context for my student fresh and front of mind, because I think it really creates a more um, valuable experience for the students to, to really have that context. I try not to make my class write all war stories. That's not what they want. But I do think that it is really useful when we're talking about something um, to describe how it might look at, during the sort of everyday practice of law. And if you've been it, been there and done that, it sort of helps you. Awesome. So up until now, we've been talking a lot about teaching. How do you pick your courses? What are some of the challenges you face in the classroom? Um, let's go ahead and pivot and pivot to the role of legal scholarship. So what is the role of legal scholarship in a law professor's career? So I'm, I'm gonna give an earnest answer and then I'm gonna give an instrumentalist cynical answer. Um, the earnest answer is, that we have to care about the stuff, <laughs> right? And so scholarship is, is the way that we really deeply engage in conversations about law and that, we, and that we really deeply engage in the issues in the law that interest us and that we think are important. And that we uh, get our ideas out there, wherever there may be, right? Into the courts, into the minds of other scholars, into the minds of students, so wherever we, we hope that those ideas eventually go. And it's how we develop our expertise, right? And so if I am looking for someone who is an expertise in X, right, that someone has established a track record through their scholarship of being an expert in that area. So that's kind of my earnest answer, right, is, is that it's just a really important way to engage with the law. My cynical instrumentalist answer is it's the way that you progress in the profession, right? A scholarship is disproportionately important in legal academia. It, as some would say it is more important than your teaching and more important than your service and more important even if people like you <laughs> right it's if you produce if if you consistently produce high quality scholarship over time that that is the thing that is going to get you promoted get you tenure get you endowed chairs get you the things right and so if you want to progress in the academy scholarship is really oftentimes what folks in institutions are looking at and weighing disproportionately to maybe some other stuff. And so it is important for your career in that way. I'll also add that it's important to even get into academia, right? You have to, when you're, when you're applying for, for an academic job, you have to at least have one or two, even for an entry level job, uh, publications under your belt. So scholarship really plays a, in, a, an inherent role in being a law professor, even though the title of our <laughs> the title of our jobs are law professor, right? It's also dependent on the institution itself. So some institutions weigh teaching more heavily than scholarship. Some more of the the larger institutions weigh scholarship more heavily than than teaching and service. So it's depending on which school you're at will depend on how scholarship plays into your tenure track and into advancing 
in, in the institution. But I'll also just add that I think being an expert in your field is important, not just for your, your career in, in the institution, but being able to connect with your fellow colleagues and, and to really delve into the law in, in an instrumental way for your classes. So for example, teaching art and cultural heritage law, I have to be an expert in the field in order to teach it in the classroom. So it, it's imperative for my teaching as well to, to keep up in the scholarship realm. Yeah, I'd largely uh, echo uh, those sentiments. You know, when they uh, talk about reviewing uh, you for tenure when you're in legal academia, when you're going up for tenure as a professor, they say scholarship, teaching, and service. Scholarship is always talked about first. Now it does vary uh, depending on what school you're you're at. Uh, typically, at the quote unquote higher rank schools, the scholarship counts for more, uh, and teaching uh, teaching counts for less. Uh, but there is some uh, some variation there. And also the type of scholarship can vary uh, at different schools. Um, some schools, uh, you know, uh, want law review articles and law review articles placed in the most prestigious journals and will, you know, gauge the quality of your uh, scholarship by which uh, law review uh, the articles are published in. And some are, are harder to publish in than others. Some are more competitive. And again, the, the higher ranked schools tend to care more about that. Some law schools aren't, don't worry about that so much, you know, uh, uh, going up for tenure. If you have two law review articles, uh, that's that's fine. And it doesn't really matter what journal they're in. Some of them, uh, you know, publishing in bar journals or writing treatises uh, can also count. So there is there is a, a variety there uh, in terms of just uh, what to do to fulfill the scholarship requirement. But I think, uh, you know, as, as was uh, noted, scholarship is kind of how you progress through the profession. Uh, it's what gains respect nationally. If you're at one law school and want to move to another one, and particularly again, you know, rankings are just part of the, this whole uh, legal academia. If you want to move to a higher ranked law school, it's going to be scholarship. It's going to be, you know, publishing the law review articles in high ranked journals uh, that will do that. So it's what kind of gains uh, attention uh, nationally also. Awesome. And I just want to take a moment and pause and thank the people who are putting questions in our Q&A function. Do not forget, you don't have to wait until the end. We're going to address them at the end, but you can put a question in the Q&A function at any time. And towards the end of the panel, we will uh, get them addressed. So thank you to those who've already done that. And um, if you have one and have not done that yet, please put your question in the Q&A function. So we talked a little bit about the role of legal scholarship. Some of you all have mentioned uh, criteria for becoming a, a law professor. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later, but one word that comes up a lot when you're talking about entering the legal academy is that or one term is the term research agenda. So professors Bazzotti and Boone, what is a research agenda and how does one go about crafting one? So when you're applying through AALS, and we'll get through that process later, you're going to see that they're asking for a research agenda. So what this essentially is, is a document that provides your, your previous scholarship and your future scholarship. What do you want to write about when you are on the tenure track, in a tenure track position? So that doesn't necessarily mean you have to write whatever is in your research agenda. It's just what do you desire, right? And then that also plays into to how you're teaching. So usually this is going to be a broad document. You're not going to have full on abstracts that you're giving on for particular pieces, but it's just kind of a connection between where you see your scholarship going as you progress in the field. And so when I was I will say that I don't think I drafted a very successful research agenda when I was on the market. I kind of had different abstracts that that different descriptions of pieces that might or may not evolve. But I think having a string between all of your potential scholarship is in, is really important in showing that you intend to be an active scholar. So that's really what the research agenda, what the purpose is, is to show that you have ideas in your mind and you are planning on becoming an active scholar if you were given the opportunity to. So I also don't think my first attempt at a research agenda was super effective. I think I've gotten better at it as I've, as I've made my way. Um, but yeah, it's basically, as, as Professor Pazzotti was saying, just a document that um, sort of chronicles in a relatively short form, you know, a, a short paragraph, 
uh, the projects that you are currently undertaking, so the papers that you're in the process of writing, the papers that you want to write in the future, and as she said, do you have to write them? Um, no one ever checks. Um, and sometimes, if, if you have them, a, a short description of prior projects, so things that you've already done. And then hopefully, right, at the, at the top or in between the paragraphs, there's different ways to format them, you give some overarching context about how all these things hang together. So yes, they want to know that you have uh, ideas and you're going to be a productive scholar. So you're not just writing one great paper, right? You've got two or three or five great papers sort of in the pipeline, but also that you understand sort of where you fit in in the larger scholarly space. So that that paragraph at the top explains how, what the through line is between all these projects, which can include your sort of particularly, uh, your particular scholarly approach. So you can say, I'm an empirical scholar, right? I, I bring an empirical lens to all these different topics, or I do critical legal theory, and I you know, bring that particular approach to these various topics. Um, so tying them together, not just substantively, sort of what they're about, but, but really presenting your sort of unique approach to scholarship and how these individual pieces reflect that approach. Awesome. And so now that we know a little bit about how to craft that research agenda, how to write about um, how your law review articles, how your other pieces are gonna be woven together. I've heard it even said that um, each different article is a different ship but it needs to be clear that they're all in the same fleet, right? And so how your, your articles are, are being woven together. But what about that person who's never written a law review article? Uh, Professor Tarpalani and Boone, can you just explain to us in a nutshell, right? So real Cliff's Notes version, how to go about writing a law review article? Yeah, I mean, there are many different approaches here, but uh, you got to start with the topic, right? You got to have something that you uh, want to write about, uh, something that's a novel, you know, I wanna have something different to say about whatever your topic is. And that could come from, you know, your practice experience. There might be an issue that you encountered that you had to resolve where the law was unsettled. Uh, and that's, you know, uh, that's a good place to start if, if there is something like that. It could come from other places, you know, other readings that you did or even something you read about in law school or elsewhere, uh, where there is uh, some unresolved uh, question. Uh, and if you have a topic area that you're interested in, you may not know what that question is right away. You know, it can change a little bit as you do more research. I think the biggest challenge is just narrowing your topic. You know, you have a general area you're interested in. You want to address a really narrow question and have an argument to make. And that's something that can happen as you get into it. But that's what I've always found to be the biggest challenge. You know, I mean, often, you know, that first article that you try to write really should have been two or three different articles. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, you can save stuff for later. And that's a hard choice to make. You know, you may have something interesting to say, but you may just have to hold on to it and save it for uh, later. Uh, I think organizing a law review article is also a challenge because they're pretty long. As you've seen, they have a lot of footnotes, a uh, lot of different sections. So how do you organize it? That's something that may also change uh, as you're writing it. And uh, law review articles tend to be uh, pretty direct, pretty explicit. They have a lot of uh, road mapping, what's called road mapping. Basically, you know, I, I see it as a tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and tell them what you told them. There is a level of redundancy there. You're very obvious and explicit. Uh, the introduction says part one of this article will do X, Y, Z. Then part two will do, you know, uh, whatever part two is going to do. Part three will do this. Uh, and you have that whole outline uh, for parts one, two, three, four. You may not give the whole outline when you're writing the introduction. Uh, and things may move around as you are writing the, the first draft of it uh, and second draft. Uh, but that's, you know, that's kind of, uh, you know, the general challenge is, is organizing it. As far as writing itself, I think everyone has a different approach to that, exactly how you go about it. Uh, conventional advice may be set aside, you know, an hour or two hours every morning or a certain day a week where you're just going to, you know, devote that time to writing. And I think that's good advice. I don't follow it at all. You know, I'm just, you know, it's, <laughs> I could go like two weeks writing a paragraph and then all of a sudden in a day or two be able to write 20 pages that it just all comes together. I think a lot of writing is just thinking, you know, going on walks or 
laying in bed or doing whatever where the ideas are kind of marinating in your mind. And for me, it eventually comes together. And, you know, I've, I've done enough of these uh, that I know that it will. Uh, I'll also say, you know, writing that first article is has all of the challenges I, I just said. But as you write one or two uh, or three in a particular area, new ideas just emerge because you're becoming an expert in the field. You're seeing what issues are out there. And you think, okay, this could be another article and that one builds to another. So they really do build up. I mean, the first one, two may be hard, but then as you get into the topic, uh, as you become an expert, the future ones come a bit easier. I think that's right. And I would, would echo the advice to like, especially at the beginning, stay reasonably narrow. Um, I think that really helps. With that being said, I know there are people out there who can write, you know, 30,000 words on something that they don't think is that interesting. I'm not one of those people. So you've got to be excited about your topic, right? You got to be excited about it because you're in it now for a long time. Um, and you're going to talk to a lot of people about it. Uh, so it has to be something that, that makes you excited, that you think is interesting, that you think is important, that it's something you want to lie in bed and think about. Um, because if you don't have that uh, sort of initial interest, it, you're not, it's going to be very hard to carry yourself to the end. I think a lot of people who are just starting out, and this was true of me when I was just starting out um, writing legal scholarship, they get really tripped up on this novel thing. They're like, well, how can I say something not right? I don't, I'm just starting. How could I possibly say something novel about this circuit split or this area of the law that's un, that hasn't already been said before? And my, um, my advice for that is just to, to really try to like be in conversation with what's already out there. And how do you do that? Okay, so you've identified a topic and you're excited about it. And then you do initial preemption check and you think, oh, well, five people have already written about this already. Okay, so think, well, what, uh, what have they gotten wrong? What have, well, maybe they've gotten everything right, but they missed a certain sort of aspect or um, like particular angle, right about that. Maybe, They've gotten it all right and you agree with everything they said, but the last article in this sort of series or conversation happened 20 years ago. What's happened since then, right? How can you update what exists there? As a professor, I always thought it was easier to write a reply brief than an opening brief. This is the same idea, right? If you, if you insert yourself into the conversation, you sort of have something to work with and that sort of dread of like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not offering something novel is lessened because you are sort of explicitly saying, I know these, this scholarship exists and I am intentionally responding to it, adding to it, clarifying it, updating it, whatever, you know, sort of whatever your unique ad is. I think that's a really great place for sort of um, early legal scholarship to start um, that, because otherwise I feel like it, it can feel very overwhelming. Um, I can I, I I can put things in the chat for everybody, right? No, I believe the chat is just uh, for us. Oh, okay. So I don't believe the attendees can. Um, never, never mind. But if you want to send something or if you have a resource, send it to yeah. me when we post it. We'll be sure to include it. Great. So I have two things um, that I think are really useful. One oh, wait is a minute. wait a minute, Tracy. Uh, from staff is saying you can. I'm gonna try, let's see what happens. So what I am not successfully attempting to send right now uh, is just, all right, I can't get it to work. Um, we'll, we'll post it, uh, we'll post it afterwards. It's a book called Modern Legal Scholarship. It just breaks down the types of law review articles that people write and examples of those types of articles, which I think is really useful. And there's also, if you don't want to get going for a whole book, a very short uh, article by Martha Minow that just talks about sort of archetypal legal scholarship, the different types and what they look like, um, and then just footnotes some examples that you can go to. Um, I think both of those things, when you're just starting out, just so you can sort of conceptualize the type of project you want to do are really useful. I'll keep trying to post these in the chat. And otherwise, uh, I'll ask that for you to, to or Professor Seal, sorry, to post them after. Perfect. All right. So now that question we've all been waiting for, you know, we've talked about how to pick your classes, how to decide 
you know, if you want to teach doctrinal, clinical, or legal research and writing, how to decide what courses you want to teach, um, what a research agenda is, how to write that first law review article. So how does one go about, once you have your package together, you have your agenda, you know what courses you want to teach, you wrote your first law review article, how does one go about entering the legal academy? So Professor Bazzotti mentioned having recently served on an appointments committee. What is an appoint, appointments committee and how is that relevant to going about entering the legal academy? And Professor Sibley, we'll start with you on this one. So I'll actually start by answering Shireen's question in the Q&A, which is, what are the qualifications needed to become a law professor? From my understanding, just a JD. That's all you need. But <laughs> that being said, when we look at the stats from the market, which is uh, kind of the law, the legal academia hiring season, which I'll talk more about in a second, uh, people generally have a JD plus something else. And so the plus something else is often a secondary graduate degree, a fellowship or a clerkship, right? And so if you have one of those things or a combination of those things, then that is better than the alternative. Um, and you should have, as Professor Bazzotti point, pointed out, you should have an article that is either completed or substantially completed before you go on the job market. So what does it mean when I talk about going on the job market? It means that the market process for legal ac academia is very formalized. So everybody applies at the same time every year. You, you apply through a centralized system. And so you fill out a form that's called a FAR form that lets the market know that you are ready to enter it. Um, and, you, and, you, and you tell the market what classes you're interested in teaching and who your recommenders are, and you show them your paper and you, and you give them your research agenda. Um, and then at some point in the fall, the market tells you who is hiring. And so they release a bulletin and it says, all of these schools are hiring in these different areas, right? And then you can apply to some of those schools directly if you would like to do that, or you can wait for kind of the market to reach out to you, right? Which, which means that those appointment committees that Professor uh, Bazadi mentioned will be looking through all of those FAR forms and all of those, those, uh, those basically applications that have come into the market and they'll be reaching out to people who they think might be a good fit for their institution. And so you start to get calls for screening interviews. These are really short interviews where they just kind of see if you're cuckoo or if you're just norm. And basically if you're normal and, the, and they've already kind of sorted you for your scholarship and for your background, then you will generally get a call back. Callbacks in the legal world are, when, when I tell people outside of legal academia about how we interview, they think that I am a crazy person for having gone through this <laughs> because you basically interview with every faculty member <laughs> at a campus, right? And then uh, in the middle of doing that, you give a presentation to all, every, all of your future colleagues. <laughs> and then you open yourself up for questions about your presentation from all of your future colleagues. And then you go back and you do some more interviews for the rest of the afternoon. Um, and, and so it's a, it's a very kind of extensive process of interviewing. But most of the work in my opinion, in terms of kind of entering the market happens in the papers, right? Is getting your job talk paper together, getting your research agenda together, getting your teaching philosophy together, if you're a clinician, getting a clinical proposal together, getting your job talk paper together, right? If you come into, into the market with a really strong package of papers, then jobs are kind of yours to lose, right? Because people can give a kind of eh, job talk, but if, but if their materials are really strong, then people are very forgiving about them kind of not like knocking out the park in terms of their interviews. And so my um, advice would just be to focus on really putting together documents that really reflect you best, right? Um, and that conform to what the market expects those documents to look like, <laughs> because that is also very important. Um, but, that, but, that, but that really present 
a really kind of whole and well-rounded picture of what you would look like as an academic and what you would look like as a colleague. Yes, I think Professor Sibley gave a very nice and thorough overview of the whole process of you know applying for legal academic jobs. I think I'll just I'll maybe step back a little bit. I mean, she also mentioned the different routes, you know, have the JD and maybe a graduate degree or do a fellowship or a clerkship with the judge. Clerkships are very uh, respected in uh, legal academia, particularly federal uh, clerkships. Uh, so there are, there are all those uh, different routes and any combination of those. Uh, but we can also just even, you know, go back to law school, being on a journal, getting your writing started, uh, you know, just uh, having experience writing academic, uh, academic articles or, or, or something like that, you know, just academic papers that can turn into articles. Uh, I think probably, you know, going back, you know, law school and even afterwards, I think uh, one thing that's really helpful, and if there's kind of one just overarching piece of advice I would give, you know, uh, stepping back before the process even starts, uh, is to get to know people in legal academia, get to know people who are law professors. You know, if you're in law school, uh, if there are some law students in the audience, it would be really helpful if you got to know your professors on a personal level, on a, on a first name basis, or where they know who you are, because those years later out after you've practiced or done whatever, they can be your references, they can give you advice. Uh, and if you're, you know, if you're out, out of law school, you know, if you've been practicing for a while, think about, did you have any professors who you did connect with in law school, uh, you know, who could be references for you or who could just uh, give you advice uh, are there other ways you can get to know professors? I think, uh, you know, serving, uh, teaching an adjunct class, something like that, you, you have access to a law faculty, uh, events at law schools. Uh, I think just getting to know people uh, gives you some insight. And also you may have uh, potential references uh, that can help you uh, help navigate you through this process because, you know, there are different variations, different law schools are different as, we, uh, as we've um, mentioned. Uh, so there may be, you know, different, venues that you haven't thought of or different uh, different things you can do to emphasize in your application. And the people who are in legal academia are in the best position to give you kind of really special in, specialized individual advice. So Professor Steele, if you don't mind, I want to center my comments on actually something that came up in the chat, but I think is relevant to this. Absolutely. So um, one, I would say I am proof that you do not have to go to a top law school to become a law professor. I graduated from the University of Pacific McGeorge School of Law in Sacramento, California. We are not a top school in terms of the US News and World Report rankings. That said, I did like um, Professor Sibley and Harpalani talked about, you know, utilize the AALS uh, Faculty Recruitment Conference, as well as the Faculty Appointments Registrar, the FAR form. None of my jobs came from that, ironically. Um, and I think, you know, to that point, in, in some respects, I'd say I'm the exception, not the rule, but I know that there are exceptions. And so that said, um, I actually would encourage anyone, you know, who wants to be a law professor, yes, go through the faculty appointments process through AALS. But there are also ways in which you can utilize the, the process and particularly the, the FAR form, not the FAR form, but the bulletin that comes out. I look at the bulletin like a one-stop shop. It lets you know which schools are hiring, what courses they want. It really lets you know like what you need to be in the running. And I actually, at some point in my, you know, interviewing process, use the bulletin to make direct ac applications. Um, and so I think that that is also an opportunity, particularly depending on what the institution is looking for. Um, and I think the other thing is, you know, I've been able to lateral. So once you're already in, um, based on the strength of my, my scholarship. But again, all that said, it was the direct application. None of it was through um, at least not as successful, <laughs> the, the schools I've gone to have been through the AALS process. So that's also something to consider. Stay flexible, I think would be my, my piece of advice. Absolutely, absolutely. And so I know that with respect to, you know, staying in the same vein about how to become a law professor, there are many people who uh, actually have fellowships or BAPs immediately prior to becoming a, a law professor and getting a, a full-time job or a permanent job. And so uh, professors Boone and Harpalani, what are fellowships? What are visiting assistant professorships or BAPs for short? And how can they assist with getting a job as a law professor? Yeah, so uh, I did both a fellowship and a VAP. Uh, VAP just stands for visiting assistant professor. Um, and 
because the sort of baseline requirements to get uh, tenure track jobs have, have, we've been saying, sort of ratcheting up and up and up, you almost need a sort of on-ramp um, to, to successfully launch yourself onto the sort of full-scale market, which is what mostly we've been talking about. So fellowships and VAPs sort of provide that on-ramp. They're one to three-year positions generally. Um, and the idea is that you get some teaching experience, that you have some time and support to write, to write that first or second article, to develop that research agenda, and to get support from the institution that you're working at to sort of go on the market. Um, Beyond that, there's really a very broad range in the types of um, positions that that exist, all the way from extremely competitive, extremely structured programs like the Clemenco or the Bigelow Fellows, where they are teaching, you know, the teaching load is small, the focus on research is great, right, and these programs are designed to successfully launch people on the teaching market. The problem is, even getting into these programs that are designed to launch you on the teaching market is, is very competitive and difficult. And then there's all sorts of other types of programs um, that are sort of less structured. The teaching load might be higher in some, it's less in some, more support, less support. Um, I did a clinical teaching fellow at Georgetown, which was a phenomenally positive experience. And that program, actually, there's a lot of fellows in that program, so there's a lot of potential opportunities. And then I did a visiting assistant uh, position at Wake um, to sort of try to be a doctrinal professor. Um, but basically these, oh, that's, that's great. I'm glad that that uh, was put in the chat. Um, they're, they're all designed to be on roads to legal teaching, but they're gonna vary a lot in sort of what your, um, what the expectations of you are and how much support they're gonna offer you to offer you. I would say the flip side is that they also have a different level of sort of autonomy. So some of the more structured programs are like, you're gonna teach these classes and you're gonna follow these steps. And that's sort of the, thing, the hoops that everyone jumps through. Whereas some of the other sort of less structured programs, maybe they're a little less structured, but also I got a lot of autonomy as a VAP in sort of deciding what classes I wanted to teach and really being treated like a full member of the faculty while I was here as a, as a visitor which was an enormously sort of beneficial experience for me. I will just echo, because I do think it's an important point. Um, I do not have a JD from an elite institution. Um, so it is absolutely possible to be a law professor without a JD from an elite institution. It is statistically harder. So most law professors come from a very short list of schools. That's just the truth of the matter. Um, so you want to sort of be wide-eyed about that as far as recognizing that that's the sort of truth of the world as it exists, while absolutely not counting yourself out if you don't have one of those JDs. Yeah, I'll just, I'll kind of add to that last comment because, you know, there are uh, some other options. There are graduate level law degrees, the LLM uh, programs and the JSD programs. And, and you know, that's, that's another option. Uh, you know, for some professors who did not go to elite schools, uh, they got an LLM later at a more uh, elite school. Uh, and some of those programs operate somewhat like the visiting uh, assistant uh, professorships that uh, Professor uh, Boone described. Uh, some of them have a kind of are designed to help you uh, become a law professor. Uh, so there are the fellowships, and I've done a fellowship and a, a VAP also, visiting assistant professorship. Uh, you know, those two things, I mean, they can be very similar. There are some fellowships that uh, are uh, not about teaching. You know, they just focus on uh, on writing. Or, or and really, the whole idea be uh, behind both of these is to give you time to be able to write a law review article, to write your first law review article. Because as we've talked about, that can be a struggle. You know, that's something that you're going to need to put uh, time and effort into. So typically, the idea behind it is, uh, you know, you'll be a visiting assistant professor uh, or a teaching fellow uh, who has a lighter teaching load than most. Uh, uh, law faculty. Sometimes you'll teach one section of legal writing, uh, maybe another course. But the idea is to be able to spend that extra time just uh, writing that law review article and you're in a law school, so you have mentorship, you have other faculty uh, who are there to, to help you out. Some of them, are, as Professor Boone mentioned, are more structured. Others, you may not have the same level of support. Some of them are considered 
uh, really elite, uh, the ones at Harvard, University of Chicago that, that she also mentioned. Uh, others, uh, you know, mine, uh, you know, I was at Seattle University, I was the Korematsu teaching fellow. Uh, and, you know, Seattle's not an elite school, but that was a pretty good fellowship. I only had one class to teach per year for my two years there, and I could really delve into writing my first uh, law review article, which took, uh, took some time. Uh, my uh, VAP uh, was at Chicago Kent uh, College of Law, again, not considered an elite school. And that program was actually designed for lawyers who were in practice, you know, who had been practicing, not necessarily, you know, in an academic setting. Uh, that wasn't my background. You know, I got the position uh, just uh, anyway, I guess they liked me, but, uh, you know, it was um, it designed for people in practice. So there are different, different types of uh, programs that have different emphasis uh, really designed for people with uh, different backgrounds. There's a whole range here. And sometimes the terminology can get confusing. So I wanted to talk just a little bit uh, about that. So my first job out of law school, uh, I was the Derek Bell Fellow at NYU School of Law. I worked with the, the late Professor Derek Bell. That wasn't really, you know, that was that was the title, you know, and I used that title, but it was really a kind of research associate uh, position at the law school, which was not a typical fellowship. But, you know, Professor Derek Bell, kind of chose out of the NYU law graduates who he wanted uh, to hire based on uh, who he knew and, and different experiences. The fellowships and VAPs, typically there's a broad application process where they'll take uh, all different types of applicants. And as I said, fellowship and VAP, uh, visiting assistant professorship, often uh, there may not be a difference really on, in how those operate. Uh, but there are just uh, what uh, you'll, you'll see visiting professorships, which are completely different. Those are for established law professors who are going to visit uh, stay for a year or two at a different law school. Uh, so the term visiting professor, you know, visiting professorship is, is used in different ways. The VAP, when you hear the term VAP, that's typically for people who are not law professors who want to become law professors and, and you know, a, a, a professorship VAP uh, to prepare you to become a law professor. Just the term visiting professor uh, by itself is usually not referring to those entry level type positions. It's referring to established uh, law professors. So, you know, that terminology can be a bit confusing. Uh, and, uh, you know, you'll see advertisements for all these uh, different types of positions if you are uh, at that stage where you're looking at those uh, to entering the job market. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so I have a few more questions and then we're gonna pivot to those questions that are in the Q&A that we've not already addressed. I'm gonna pose this next question to Professors Bazzotti, Pleasant and Sibley. What specific challenges do women of color face in obtaining a job as a law professor? And what advice do you have for overcoming those challenges? In obtaining a job as a law professor, I think we as women of color are expected to hold, I would say, more. We're, we're expected to be a little bit more more perfect than I would say other applicants. We should have either uh, a higher degree outside of the JD. We need to be publishing and better in law journals, right? We also have to, to overcome what I would like to call tokenism, right? That we're not just being uh, asked to serve <laughs> on a tenure track position or any type of position just because we, are, we satisfy that diversity quotient that a given law school wants to, or it needs to, to, to have. So overcoming that on the market is incredibly important and, and not selling yourself short, not having what we call imposter syndrome, right? You have the ability to, to go on the market. You have the ability to get a job, right? Just because you might not have, let's say this type of perfect CV that a lot of schools are looking for, it doesn't mean that you're not capable of becoming a law professor. So getting over that imposter syndrome is incredibly important. And then when you actually have that job, I think Professor Harpalani uh, noted this earlier about establishing authority in the classroom. It's, it's an incredibly difficult task as a woman of color to do, especially when you all have students who don't res you, that just don't respect your authority and you have to, uh, you have to overcome that. And then we also are statistically, uh, we have a heavier service load than I say other other colleagues, right? We're expected to, let's say, I, I mean, I volunteer for this. Where I'm on, I'm the advisor for the Latinx Law Student Association, right? I'm, I tend to be more of a 
advisor to some of the Latinx law students at my school, right? So we're expected to carry some of that heavier service load than some of our other colleagues. And Professor Pleasant, I want you to chime in um, as well as Professor Sibley. But before you do, Professor Bazzotti, I do understand that you have to leave early to go to this little thing we call class. And so because of that, whenever you need to drop off, just go ahead and thank you so much for taking the time to, you know, class that class prep time right before class is important. So we appreciate you taking the time to uh, engage with us. Um, Professor Pleasant, same question, specific challenges that women of color face in, uh, as law professors and how have you gone about overcoming this challenge, these challenges? So I would echo everything that Professor Bazzotti said. I think when I entered the academy full-time, I was actually, I'd say naive to some extent because I went to an institution that was new where every founding faculty member had been at other institutions, but wanted to create something different. And so that again is a very unique, exceptional circumstance that I had where I wasn't faced with, I think, challenges that my colleagues um, who are trying to enter the market have had. Now that said, having now been in the academy for a little while and having been ser having served on appointments committees and looking at the hiring process, I would echo women of color, I think are, are criticized more harshly than our, our colleagues from the scholarship to the way you present to whether your job talk was scholarly enough. Um, I think just the level of, of critique and criticism is heightened when you are a woman of color. And to also echo Professor Bazzotti, you can volunteer for scholars for, for service, but sometimes service comes to you in the in the mode of students who are looking for someone who looks like them, who's empathetic, who gets it. Um, and I think that disproportionately falls on us. And also just from a gendered standpoint, as women, there are things that innately we do that uh, others do not. And so I definitely would say, you know, as you enter the academy, be mindful of those things because it takes time away from you as well. And you have to create boundaries. Um, and then the last point, imposter syndrome is real. Um, you know, thinking that you are able, especially again, if you're looking at your credentials, I, I came across some of my notes actually when I was starting to apply in 2012 and it was, you have to have a VAP, you have to write, you have to do these things. And I didn't have to do those things, right? What was for me was for me, but I'm not naive that that actually does happen that those things are you know, present. And so just being mindful of how to navigate them as a woman of color and talking to other women of color who've gone before you can also I think help you learn to navigate this process. I'm going to be extremely frank here because I think this is a really important question. Um, so we know because there's research out there that shows us that women of color, women in general, but especially women of color, get lower evaluation, get lower scores in our teaching evals because of bias. That when people know that scholarly articles are written by a person of color or woman of color, they are judged more harshly than if people think that those articles are written by a man or a person who is not of color. Um, and that the perception of candidates of color is just different than perceptions of candidates who are not of color, right? That those things exist. And so when we go on the market of people of color, we have to understand that that's what is happening, right? And that other people actually sometimes either don't know or don't acknowledge that that's what's happening, right? And so they will judge your teaching evals as if they don't understand that there's this gap, yeah, right? Like people will read my teaching evals that will say things that are clearly gendered. <laughs> Right. And we'll, and we'll think, oh, but but she got a 4.6 instead of a 4.8. And it's like, yeah, but if you read the comment, you would see that actually something disturbing was happening there that had nothing to do with me. Right. It had to do with the fact that someone someone didn't like a lady up in front. Right. Um, and, and so the, the, those things exist and those are things that we have to navigate. And we have to when we're on the market really do a lot of work to make sure that people are actually seeing us. So I've had people say to my face, well, to get more candidates in like you, you know, like more people of color, then maybe we should like lower their standards. And I'm like, but I went to a T14 school. I have a clerkship, a secondary graduate degree and a VAP, <laughs> right? But somehow in your mind, women of color don't have those things. <laughs> Right. And so even when you're literally looking at one and talking to one, somehow the dissonance isn't 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 clearing. Right. 
And so we have to understand that those things are happening and really navigate and manage those things ourselves in the market to get past that. Um, I, I think that, that once you're in the academy, besides the service things that, that again, there's a lot of research that shows that, that there is a lot of service that women and people of color and especially women of color do that is unrecognized and that will not ever show up in your promotion and tenure package and that there's not even a space in your progress report to report that you did it. <laughs> and so, you know, um, and so that all is very real and very true. But I think that there's also something which I find um, uh, taxing over time, which is that oftentimes in academia, people think that people of color are the Lorax. And by that, I mean, they think that we should speak for the trees, right? And so all, the, all of a sudden, you're not speaking for yourself ever, <laughs> right? You're not, you're not giving your opinion. You're not giving your perspective or your experience, right? All, the, all of a sudden, it's, oh, Professor Sibley, can you tell us, right, some huge question about Blackness? And I'm like, mm, probably, right? And I don't mind doing, doing, doing that, especially because my, my scholarship is actually in things like CRT, so I love talking about race, but it's this presumption that somehow I can speak for the trees, right, in a, in a way that they, they don't put on men or, or non, you know, or non people of color. Um, and so I, I think that that's also something that you have to be aware of and have to navigate because even at schools that have very good faculty diversity, they have very bad faculty diversity, <laughs> right, and so you're always going to be if you're a person of color, one of too few on the faculty, right? And, and what that means is that you have to take on a disproportionate um, uh, share of all the things that that entails. Awesome. All righty, so right now we're gonna go ahead and pivot to the question and answer. And so again, for those questions that we have not already answered, um, we're gonna throw them out there. Whoever wants to, to jump in, feel free to just go ahead and jump in. Uh, first question is, how do you go about creating the curriculum? Do you have any examples that people give you or help when you're starting out as a law professor? Can I just jump in real quick? If you're Absolutely. going to teach legal research and writing, there is uh, two organizations, the um, Association of Legal Writing Directors and the Legal Writing Institute. And there is what we call a teaching brief bank that has not only problems, but curriculum and things of that nature. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel, particularly in legal writing. I will just say that I have found when I was starting out, people were enormously generous, people at my own institution, people at other institutions, people I met at conferences, random people, right? When I was like, I'm new and I'm teaching X for the first time, people were absolutely willing to share their syllabus and recommend case books. And, and um, you do not have to reinvent the wheel, especially when you're first starting out. You can just pick up the wheel that someone has already created and adapt it for yourself. And then once you get into it a little bit, right? Once you get your feet under you, then you can think, oh, I'd rather teach this, this unit as opposed to this unit. Or I really, this case book's not working for me. I'm gonna do something else. But at the beginning, you shouldn't feel like you are creating these things Absolutely. Our next question, uh, following up on a point that Professor Harpalani made, how do you manage, and, and that we've uh, addressed this question was sent pretty early on, um, how do you manage those concerns that women of color face in maintaining authority and respect in the class and balancing those concerns with connecting with and meeting students where they are academically? Anybody can jump in. I'll prefer to, I'll defer to Professor Sibley. Um, I I think that and and I I have uh, qualms with imposter syndrome because I think that imposter syndrome for some people actually is just a recognition of what is actually happening, right? It is a it is a recognition of the fact that people are treating you as if you were an imposter. Um, but I I think that you you just have to know that that you're. That, that, that you're confident and that you know your stuff, right? There, is, there are very few 1L classrooms that I could walk into in the world and not be able 
to kind of, and this is obviously not a competition, but I can run circles around those people. They don't know anything. They just started law school, <laughs> right? I know a lot of things. And so I built my authority through a demonstration of my competence and knowledge, right? It's, it's, it's not that, that, that I want them to, to respect my kind of authority, qua authority, right? Like I'm in front and I'm a professor. And so you respect me. It's that they, they, they learn very quickly that they need something from me, right? That I have something to give them, <laughs> right? That they want. And that's actually how I found that it works for me to build authority. And that works very well with kind of meeting students where they, where they are and connecting with students, right? It's, it's, that, it's not about me being a professor. It's about me having information, knowledge, experience, et cetera, that they want <laughs> and being able to give that to them in a way that's accessible to them. And that actually uh, uh, makes them feel kind of heard, respected, understood, et cetera. So can I can I jump in just very briefly? Absolutely. So I'm not a woman of color, uh, but I am a woman. And I think when I, especially when I started teaching of a woman who presented as roughly the same age as her students. I've now got some gray hairs and some wrinkles, which helps just naturally uh, garner a little bit of respect at the front of the classroom. Um, but especially at the beginning, I got a lot of advice to like, you have to show, you know, you have to go in there tough and you have to write command authority and because they're not going to give it to you because you're a young woman. And at the end of the day, I just sort of decided, I'm like, that's not me, right? Like that's, it's not going to come across as authentic. I, that's just not my personality. So I sort of, and I think this is speaking to what Professor Sibley was saying, just sort of modeled the sort of relationship I wanted to have from the front of the room, which was, listen, I have something to offer you. I have a lot of things that I know that you don't. And especially if you're teaching one else, you have things to offer them without a doubt. But also, hey, I'm new at this, right? And I'm interested in getting better at it. And I'm interested in your feedback to get better at it. Um, and I'm gonna make a mistake. And you know what happens when I make a mistake? I'm gonna say, I made a mistake and here's how I fix it. Um, and I felt like when I came into the classroom with that energy, just being like transparently sort of who I was and comfortable in the fact that I was new and learning, they didn't challenge me because there was nothing to, cha there was not nothing to challenge, right? I was like, you're right, I'm new and I'm learning. Let's get better together. Um, so I guess I would just say that I, there is a lot of advice about sort of commanding respect from the front of the classroom. And I think that you do want to command respect, but I just would encourage everyone to sort of be authentic to who they really are. Um, because at the end of the day, I think that is going to, that's going to resonate with your students so much more than any sort of act you put on about like, I am a law professor. Awesome. So we are running out of time. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep going through these questions, but we're going to do rapid fire from here on out. Um, uh, how does an attorney with a diverse and rich practice background plus several publications, but a non-excellent GPA in law school land an academic job? Here's my rapid fire answer. Your law school GPA doesn't mean squat. And at the end of the day, I'll, I'll echo what my colleagues, Professor Sibley and Boone said, you know more than what they do and you have something to offer stay true to that um and you know just keep plugging away until you get that job awesome. you can write right. your way out of anything and it seems like you've already started writing your way out of anything so you can write your way out of a bad gpa or a non-elite jd right you, you, that is uh, a takeaway from the program you can write your way out of anything you really can uh, these next two questions I'm going to combine because they both talk about having foreign law degrees. So how feasible is it for a lawyer with a foreign law degree to get into the U.S. law teaching market? I would suggest that if you want to teach U.S. law, you probably want to go for an LLM or some other advanced law degree from a U.S. school. Um, if you want to teach international law or, or, or some kind of, kind of niche in there, then, then maybe there's a way to do it. I'm not sure, but everyone who, who I know who is foreign, foreign trained has, has found it easier to get a supplementary US law degree before going on the market. 
Yeah, I'll just add, you know, I mean, if, if there's a comparative law aspect, if you want to do comparative law, you do have professors who have uh, law degrees from, from other countries. And I know a number from Canada, from Canadian law schools, at least, you know, um, who've done it. So it may depend on where. But yeah, there are certain areas where you can go with a, a foreign law degree, uh, you know, particular niches, as Professor Sibley said. Awesome. Next question. So what do you think about the prospect of getting a tenure track role if you begin as an adjunct, is that the type of is that type of conversion really possible? Yes, I've done it. <laughs> I just want to say yes, absolutely. There are people who, if you have an adjunct, the word adjunct on your resume, they're going to automatically discount you. Those people are wrong, but they do exist in the world. Absolutely. And I'm just going to take some moderator's privilege and throw in how adjunct can helping aside from giving you teaching experience or you've been in a classroom before. You also have these wonderful things called student evaluations. And those can be helpful when you are going on the market. So as opposed to the person who's never taught and has to go on the market with no eval, sometimes those teaching evaluations um, from your days as an adjunct can also be helpful. Alrighty, so next question. Matter of fact, I have several uh, adjunct related questions. So can you discuss a little bit more about adjunct faculty positions, how to get them, uh, what value do they hold on a CV, et cetera? Now, again, the focus of this program was full-time law teaching positions. But we know the adjunct um, positions is where a lot of young lawyers start, where a lot of young lawyers are interested. So to our panelists, uh, any more insights on adjunct teaching positions, how to get them the value they hold on a CV, et cetera? So I can't speak to the value it holds on my CV, but I can say the way that I approached adjunct teaching was actually the same way I approached getting a full-time tenure track job, direct application. So. I initially was an adjunct um, undergrad teaching political science, which is what my undergrad degree was in. Um, and then when I sought my first legal writing job, direct applied um, again to the program to teach legal writing. Um, initially, I was looking at upper level courses like appellate advocacy, but the director thought it would be best for me to teach in the first year. And I'm glad that that happened. So I think direct applications are one and looking at your experience and figuring out where you can meet a need is another. Awesome. In the context of selling yourself as a candidate, is a law review article that was well received but written several years ago of any value, or will it be ignored as being too far back? Yeah, it's definitely a value. You know, you put it on your CV. Anything academic that you've done, anything that you've published, uh, and particularly say a note that you wrote in, in uh, when you were in law school uh, or law, law review article several uh, from several years ago. So anything academic is a value. That said, the best thing to do when you are actually, you know, if you're invited back for an interview, when you're on the market, is to have an article that's kind of in progress, you know, far enough along that you can speak about it. Maybe it's been accepted to a journal, but that's the general advice you would get for the actual presentation when you go, when you're invited back to a school and do a job talk. Uh, that's, that's preferable. Awesome. All righty, so last question of the panel. This one is to all panelists. Um, what advice, what general advice would you give to young lawyers who are interested in joining the legal academy? Let's start with you, Professor Sibley. My advice would be to find your people. So I, uh, when, when I started thinking about pivoting back into academia and especially into legal academia, the thing that helped me most was to find people who I could really talk to and people who were invested in me and people who cared about me and people who were like me. And so I found the listservs, I found the conferences, I found the professors, I found folks to talk to about all this stuff because it's a lot of, it's a lot of insider baseball. It's a lot of insider knowledge, right? And, and, it's, and it's not always easy to even figure out where to look to get that knowledge when you're on the outside, right? And so having people in your corner who, who can say, this is what a research agenda should look like. This is what you should be doing now. This is how you should be revising. Your, this is who you should be talking to, right? Because sometimes you don't even know who the people are in your field because you're a practitioner, right? And so, and so you've, you've, you've been 
researching something and you haven't talked to somebody who's very important in that particular area, right? Because you just didn't know. And somebody will tell you that, right? And so, and so creating a community around yourself of folks who are invested in you making this transition and helping you do that, I think to me was really the most important thing that I did. Awesome. We'll go in reverse alphabetical order. So Professor Pleasant. Um, I would echo Professor Sibley. And I think when you're in the position, so us, to be able to reach back. So I'll give you a quick anecdote. I have a former teaching assistant that has been talking to me for years about becoming a law professor. And so I have looped her into conferences that I go to, um, to give her the exposure um, to the profession. Because I think there's a lot of, like as Professor Sibley said, a lot of insider baseball things you don't know. And having that exposure at least opens your eyes as to what you need to do to be prepared. Professor Harpalani. I'll echo those sentiments. You know, the networking part is important. Get to know people in legal academia, get to know professors. If you have contacts, you know, professors from law school that you are still in touch with, or you think uh, would remember you and that you had a good relationship with, uh, get in touch with them. Uh, you know, think about different uh, ideas uh, uh, in terms of scholarship things, issues that you're really interested in that keep you up at night uh, in your practice or whatever you're doing. Uh, where you may have questions uh, that you can write about. So in addition to kind of getting to know people, kind of uh, get that uh, get that part started. Uh, just go on the internet, look at different law school websites, look at who their faculty are, uh, what they're doing. That may give you more ideas uh, about what you what you may want to do. And uh, you know you may even want to reach out to some of those people, even if you don't know them. Uh, you know that can always be helpful. Uh, you know they may not respond, but uh, you won't know unless you try. And Professor Boone. I think as we've made clear, these jobs are hard to get, but they're awesome jobs. If that hasn't come through, like I think I have hands down the best job in the world. No contest. I'll go to Tojo with anyone. So if it's think, if something you think you want to do, go for it. Know the insider baseball, right? Find your people and figure out the insider baseball rules so that you can figure out which part of the insider rules you want to ignore, right? Like get all the knowledge and then be true to who you are, and uh, if if you're willing to to keep working at it, chances are high that it'll it'll come around for you eventually. Absolutely. All righty, and with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up our program. Thank you very much for attending today's program. We invite you to attend future ABA YLD Women of Color Task Force events. On Friday, December 3rd at 1 p.m. Eastern, the task force will host the first installment of its Fireside Chat Friday series. Our featured guests on December 3rd will be Dean Brownie Lewis from, the, from North Carolina Central University Law School. Uh, additionally, if you are interested in more information on entering legal academia, ABA YLD Chair Elect Joe Bond will host a boot camp of sorts on entering legal academia, academia during her bar year as chair. In closing, we'd like to thank our speakers, Professors Emily Bazzotti, Megan Boom, B'nai Harpalani, Shakira Pleasant, and Shonda Sibling for their participation in today's program. And we'd also like to thank ABA YLD Chair Troy Portis, the Women of Color Task Force members, and ABA YLD staff, Renee Lugo and Tracy Camp, who were instrumental in putting this program together. Finally, we would like to thank you all for joining us. Have a wonderful afternoon.